how to set up an EC2 instance, how to connect EC2 to the internet, what is a virtual private what the fuck are how AWS ACLs work, why does AWS suck? If you have ever gone through the trouble of setting up your web server to be available through the internet via EC2, configuring a virtual private cloud, setting up routing tables in your internet gateway, et cetera, et cetera, well, then you know it can be quite painful. However, with AWS LightSail, Amazon actually got something right in terms of the developer experience, especially when you're just getting into managing and maintaining your server for the first time. The way that you get there is just going to the Amazon console and then searching for LightSail and it will pop up right away. So I'm already logged in and you can already see that I have an instance running here. So what is Amazon LightSail? Essentially what LightSail allows you to do, it allows you to easily spin up EC2 instances, which happens under the hood, and they don't come with a virtual private cloud, meaning you don't need to configure routing tables and access privileges, etc. Everything really just works out of the box. You can also very easily assign uh, domains to them, update the DNS records, spin up databases that you might need, spin up individual containers from Docker images. So AWS LightSail really makes things easy for you. So today we'll just go through the process of setting up our own Ubuntu instance, accessing that via SSH, setting up domain name resolution, and installing Node via the Node version manager so we can actually test if the instance is available through the internet. To kick things off, simply click on Create Instance. Here you can choose your platform. You have the option of choosing between a Microsoft server or an Ubuntu or Linux server. I always go with the Linux server. Click on OS only because I want to manage the installations of the, any dependencies I might need or software myself. And then I go with Ubuntu since that's the version I feel has the most support and whenever you encounter an issue, it's very easy to Google for those. Next up, you can optionally add a launch script. Um, this, what this will allow you to do is if you have the same setup over and over again, and you have multiple instances of individual servers that you're running, this might be very useful for you. In our case, we need an SSH key. I already have one configured here, but let's create a new one. So let's just hit create. And this will be our Nginx LightSail key because we will be using this instance later on in our Nginx video, which is going live right now. So make sure to follow up on that afterwards. Let's generate a new pair and download the private key. Got it. Make sure you don't lose the private key. So what you should do ideally right away is open up your terminal and inside your terminal, navigate to your .ssh directory, which is usually under your home directory. Once there, move the key from your downloads folder into your SSH directory. So for that, move downloads nginx LightSail key and into the current directory. Next up, we need to restrict access to that key file for security reasons. Otherwise, your SSH client will probably refuse to use it. So for that, run sudo chmod 700 and then nginLightSail key. What this will do is it will only provide modification access and read and execution access to the owner of the file, which in this case is you. So going back to our browser, let's choose the newly created key here and select our instance size. You can see that you have three months of free use for the three smallest instances. For our use, we can just go with the smallest one, which should definitely suffice. For the down, you can choose a name. So let's call this one Nginx tutorial because that's what we'll be using it for later on. And you can add some keys and tags to manage and easily group and find your instances later on. In my case, I don't have a lot, so I don't need that. There we go. Now that we have our instance running, you can click on the instance and go to manage. Because at the moment, the public IP address that this instance has is one that will be reset every time you stop and restart the instance. Now, that's unfortunate for many reasons. So one is when you assign a domain name to point to that IP address, you would have to update that DNS record every time you restart the instance. Also, whenever we SSH into our instance, if we reference this public IP address and it changes, then we won't be able to easily SSH into the instance anymore. How we solve for that is when we are in the instance management section, 
we can go to networking. And under networking, we can attach a static IP address. What this does, it, it will assign the same IPv4 address every time the server restarts. Great, and now we see that we have a static IP address attached to this instance. Note though that if you ever delete this instance, your static IP address will remain in a detached state. And a public a static IP address in a detached state will actually incur a monthly cost of $5 or so. So make sure that when you delete your light set instance, you also delete your static IP address. You will find that under your main light cell management console and then under networking. And you can see that these are both attached. But if you delete your light cell instance, then you will see that this is displayed in a detached state. So make sure to delete that afterwards as well. Going back to our light cell instance, scroll down to IPv4 firewall settings. And we can see that port 22 is enabled, which will be used for SSH and port 80. However, port 80 is only the HTTP port. We also want to enable the HTTPS port for later on. The HTTPS port is port 443, so just create that. And since we have the duplicate rule for IPv6 enabled, when we scroll down here, we also see that these ports are available for the IPv6 address as well. At the moment, we don't need to worry about load balancing or distribution at all, so we can scroll back up. So now we have a publicly available IPv4 address that doesn't change after reboots. What we want to do now is we want to add a DNS record to point to that address. Now, if you manage your domains via a different provider other than Amazon, then what you would have to do is you would just have to go to your provider and update the A record to point to this address for whatever subdomains you would like to point them to. And your, I think, quadruple A record for your IPv6 address to point to your public IPv6 address as well. Now, if you have your domains managed via AWS, via Route 53, you're able to transfer ownership of that domain to LightSail. Or you can register a new domain via LightSail entirely. So if you go back to the, your general LightSail management console and go to domains and DNS, you can create a DNS zone for domains you've already registered, which allows you to update your DNS entries. Or you can even register a domain via AWS LightSail directly. However, at the time of making this video, AWS LightSail comes with a few limitations on what you can and can't do with your DNS records in a LightSail managed DNS zone. One example of that is if we go into the domain that I've registered here and into DNS records and add a new record, what you can see is you can't add a .txt to an Apex domain, so without a record value. This is unfortunate when you're registering your domain ownership, for example, to be indexed via Google search. Um, so I would recommend to keep your DNS hosted zone either in Route 53, if you're doing it via AWS, or whatever hosting provider you already have for your domains. Anyway, that was a bit of a sidetrack. So going back to our actual AWS LightSail instance, since I have one domain managed directly via AWS LightSail, I can just go to domains within my instance management section, click on my domain, add a subdomain, and I can just type nginx here as my subdomain for douglasriser.com and assign that to my static IP address, which essentially just creates an A record. I can repeat the same step by selecting my domain again, subdomain, enter the same subdomain and add that to IPv6 address as well. In that case, it will also create the quadruple a record for IPv6 addresses. Now that is already everything we need to do on the AWS LightSail console side of things. Everything else we can do by SSHing into that instance from our local machine. So to do that, go back to your terminal. We can create or modify our SSH config file, and that will allow us to SSH into our machine more easily. In my case, I already have one set up, which is the just a config file with no extension at all. If you don't already have the file, you can simply create it and it will just work out the box. In my case, I will open up in my favorite code editor and add my new entries at the very bottom. First, you specify a host. So this is essentially the name you'll be using when you SSH into your instance. In my case, I'll just call it Nginx Tutorial. Next up, you specify the user, so the user of that system. 
And if you chose the Ubuntu version, which I chose, you will suppose simply be Ubuntu. Next up, you specify the host name. So that will be the IP address of your instance. In our case, since we already assigned our DNS record, we can actually use that one. So we can just call it nginx.douglas-riser.com. Next up, we add the identity file. So the identity file is the reference to our SSH key. And then the name of that was nginx like sale key.pem. Next up, there are two properties I also like to add is add keys to agent and identities only. This just avoids some potential issues on my Mac. So once you're done with that, make sure to save and go back to your terminal. Inside your terminal, you should just be able to SSH into your machine by using SSH and then the host name that you provided. So in my case, Nginx tutorial. It will ask you to verify the fingerprint, which you can just enter yes for the first time. And this time you're brought straight to the server. The first thing I always like to do is I always like to run su apt update. App is essentially the package manager for your Linux or Ubuntu-based systems. And what the update command will do is it will update the local repositories so that it will be able to compare your actually installed package versions to the latest up-to-date versions. It won't actually do the updating of those individual packages themselves. To do that, you can run sudo apt upgrade. This will usually uh, hit yes. This will usually take anything from two to five minutes. So just give it a bit and I'll meet you back when the upgrading is complete. So during the upgrade process, I was confronted with this screen. Essentially it's saying that a new version of a configuration file, which is in your SSHD config has been found, but that the version modifications don't match and there's a difference between the two versions. In that case, I found that you can just keep the local version that's currently installed and move on. So the upgrade process took around about five minutes for me. One thing I always like to do before commencing is going back to my browser and looking for a DNS checker to make sure that my DNS entries have actually propagated correctly and are already up to date because they might not propagate immediately and that can cause some difficult to debug issues even though everything is working correctly just because your DNS entries aren't pointing to the correct IP address yet. So in my case, let's just enter nginx darkestmithriser.com, look up the DNS entries, and we can see that our records A and quadruple A are pointing to the correct IP addresses. Of course, if we try to open our website in our browser, then we will see that nothing happens. The site can't be reached because even though the IP address is publicly available, there's nothing listening on port 80 yet. But what we can do just to verify that everything works as expected is we can install Node and run an express web server to produce a response so that we can verify that all of our setup has worked properly. To do that, go back to your terminal. And I'm still SSH'd into my instance here and copy paste this command. You will find it in the description below. Essentially what it will do is it will simply fetch the node version manager from this URL and run the install script. Afterwards, you can either exit out of your SSH terminal and SSH back in so that you can use NVM properly, or you can just copy paste this command and hit enter. So now if you run NVM hyphen V, you will see that your node version manager is installed with the proper version. Next up, we can use NVM to install the long-term supported current version of Node. So that seems to have installed properly. And if we run Node-V, we see that the latest Node version is installed. So let's just set up a test repository, make your test cd into that, run npm init. You can just enter through all of that. The only reason why we needed that is we can run npm install express to install our express web server. And in the meantime, let's just get a hello world example from the express website. Copy paste that, go into your terminal, run nano to open up a text editor and then index.js and then copy paste the code from our express web server. Now this listens on port 3000. And if you recall, we haven't provided access to port 3000 yet. 
So let's go back to our web interface, to our Lightset instance, to networking, and add the rule that we want to allow access to port 3000. The reason we have to do that is port 80 is a protected port. So if you try to run your node index.js on port 80, you will get an access violation error. But with port 3000, that, that should be completely fine. So let's run node index.js. You will see that the app is listening on port 3000. Now, if you open up your web browser and go to your original domain and append the port 3000, you will get a secure error because it will default to SSH. So let's just remove the S here. So it's just HTTP and then Nginx. And we get our hello world response. So now that your server is up and running, you can do whatever you want with it. But some of the typical tasks that you might want to do is serving some static files like your HTML, JavaScript, CSS, etc. You might want to serve your Express on something other than port 3000, but actually have it act as a web server for a certain URL. And you actually might want, you might want to host multiple websites from your single server. Now, all of that you can do with manual configuration in a ton of different tools, but there's one tool to do it all, and that is called Nginx. Lucky for you, my Nginx video is going online at the same point in time as this video. So make sure to check it out right here, where we will walk through securing our connection, hosting multiple sites, using the load balancer, setting up our HTTP proxy, and serving static content. All of that in just a few minutes, so definitely check that out. But before you do that, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the channel if this video has been helpful to you at all. I greatly appreciate that you watched until the end. See you in the next one, and as always, happy coding.